Um, I'm very happy to be giving this talk today uh, because I think it's an area that even our most medical knowledge savvy residents, even as third years, sort of can look like a deer in headlights with anything related to dermatology. Um, so I think it's great that you're getting this early in your training. And I wanted to really make this both a practical talk as well as one that may um, incorporate some board-based knowledge for you. But I first want to hear from you. And I am curious, and um, you guys, the chiefs may need to help me with the chat box because I can't seem to see it. Oh, here we go. I want to know on a scale of one to 10, how confident you feel diagnosing dermatologic disorders. And I know we have some budding dermatologists in the audience but just enter it in the chat, 10 being very, very confident, one being I do not think I can diagnose anything. <clears throat> okay, good. So I see some twos, but I see some fives, fantastic. Mostly in the lower numbers. And that's, that's kind of what I would expect. Um, and so I hope this proves to be a useful, useful talk for you today. Um, I don't want you to become this kind of internist, right? Where we can identify cellulitis, everything else is a macular papular rash. Um, that's what we want to avoid. So, um, and I can tell you that's where a lot of people feel they set, sit even after their residency training. So today what we're going to do is we are going to identify common presentations of dermatitis in the outpatient setting. And I want you to be able to direct the management of common causes of dermatitis. I love modern art. And for any of you who have ever taken an art history class, one of the first things you've probably done is learned how do you engage in formal analysis of a painting? And what that means is really having a systematic way to describe what you see, not to interpret, but to describe what you see. And so this is a painting by Kandinsky, um, who was um, from the Bauhaus in Germany in the 1920s. And I like to use this as an example because it is not figurative art. So I see on a light colored neutral background, I see many angular lines, um, geometric shapes. Um, some of these lines are very thin and intersecting with others. There are some half circles, some full circles. And then in the upper left corner is a black circle, quite large, with a central purple circle. And <clears throat> that's how I would describe this work. Dermatology is very similar. You may not know what you are looking at. You may not be able to diagnose it, but you need to know how to describe it. And you learn this in medical school, right? So you need to go through the morphology size, color, shape, and distribution. I'll often say, when you're presenting to your attending, I should have an image in my head of what I'm expecting to see when I walk in the room, and it should match up pretty closely. And if not, that's, that's something that we need to work on in terms of your own descriptive analysis of what you see. So just a quick refresher, there's primary morphologies, which you see here. Some textbooks will list one centimeter as the cutoff, some will list 0.5. Flat, smaller lesions, less than one centimeter, we call macules. Larger lesions, greater than one centimeter that are flat, are called patches. Same thing with papules. Um, some people use a 0.5 centimeter cutoff. They're raised solid lesions, less than 0.5 centimeters. And a raised solid lesion greater than this would be called a plaque. So remember to familiarize yourself with these descriptive terms. And then there's secondary morphology. So this is going to be modification of the primary lesion by either the environment or by the individual themselves. So I'm going to just throw some examples up here of commonly seen secondary morphologies. This is a, um, an example of like kenification or thickening of the skin. You can see the exaggerated markings of um, the lines in the skin. Here's an example of excoriations with some, some crusting, scaling, and some crusts, and perhaps some erosions. Um, and really, that is, sorry, we'll go forward, um, atrophy of the skin. You can see the thinning skin, the visibility of the vessels beneath the skin, some striae. And this is an example of scaling or, or shedding of the stratum corneum um, or collection of the keratin. Configuration. You should be able to describe, are these grouped? Is this an annular lesion, right? Is this a targetoid lesion? Are they scattered? 
And just to give you an example, how important configuration is, when I think of an annular lesion in the primary care setting, my differential has already been you know, stripped down substantially. Um, so you may be talking about a lesion like this, which is an annular lesion. It's a, a patch-like lesion with uh, a pink erith to erythematous border, a circumscribed border with central clearing consistent with erythema migrant. This is another annular lesion, which I would describe as um, annular. There is a raised erythematous border with central scaling consistent with tinea corporis. Classic example of targetoid lesions, multi erythema multiform. And this is another annular lesion, right, with, a, with sort of a firm or rope-like border um, and no scaling. And this is consistent with annuloma, uh, granuloma annulare. And so these are just some of the common things we might see in primary care. And to emphasize the importance of configuration and shape. Where is the lesion located? Is this in sun-sensitive areas? Is it localized, discrete? Is it symmetric, asymmetric? Um, whatever descriptive terms you can use, the better. And what I want you to do now is I want each of you, you can close your eyes for a second if you need to, think about inflammation. What does inflammation of the skin look like to you? And I want you to visualize this in your head. Maybe it's a recent patient you saw, maybe you just have a, an image in your head. And the reason I mention this is because I think this is a very useful talk to highlight some of the areas where structural racism impacts our education. And one of the most prominent examples of this in dermatology is the lack of images in patients with skin of color. There was a study that actually looked at this and 4.5% of images in textbooks were on patients with skin of color, 4.5%. Dermatology, a central skill in dermatology is pattern recognition. So I love this quote by um, Jenna Lester. If you're only trained to look at something in one color, you won't recognize it in another color. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, one of the residents, one of the third years a few weeks ago told me, I screwed up royally with this in the inpatient setting and I missed a diagnosis because it wasn't a pattern that he had recognized. When I did a, my own Google search and I just typed in inflammation of skin, none of you will be surprised. This is what came up and it went on and on and on. Images of light colored skin, like nicely contrasted with erythema. And the only picture in, in a patient of color was the cartoon figure up in the upper left um, that showed a heat rash. So this is what our eyes are being trained to see. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. I will leave you with some resources at the end so you can become familiar with different types of presentations of dermatologic disease in different in patients with different skin tones. Um, for example, probably most of you here have seen this so far in your intern year, right? This is sort of the classic cellulitis, unilateral, erythematous, warm to touch, tender, and notice how subtle it can be in a darker pigmented skin tone. So for erythema in darker tones, you wanna to think less about reds, pinks, and more about darker, hyperpigmented, violaceous hues. Um, this is an example of meningococcemia, sort of the classic purpura on the left. And on the right is an image of the same condition um, but really hyperpigmented focal lesions. If I told you this was a 40-year-old coming into your outpatient clinic with dry skin and pruritus um, in their antecubital fossa, you may say this is atopic dermatitis. Dr. Goldberg, I got this. Let's start a steroid. But what if this patient came in complaining of pruritus and dry skin? Well, you may not think about atopic dermatitis. And yet, in African Americans, sort of the accentuation of the hair follicles is much more typical and classic presentation. So being aware of different presentations of and skin manifestations of disease in patients with different skin colors is vitally important. Um, and this is an example of COVID toe, right? Um, kind of classic, very striking, much more subtle in a darker pigmented. 
Okay, so with that, we're going to jump to a board question. You do not need, we're not gonna do a poll, but I do want you to commit to an answer for the question. You can write it down in front of you. <clears throat> this is a 32 year old woman it is evaluated for a 10 month history of pruritus and scaling of both her hands. She's a child care worker and washes her hands frequently. Medical history is unremarkable and she takes no medication. And on physical exam, her vital signs were normal and this is what you see. There's no scale or erythema of the feet. The remainder of the exam is normal. Results of potassium hydroxide microscopy from the scale of her hands is negative. Which of the following is the most appropriate management for this patient? Okay, so commit to your answer and we're gonna move forward. Okay, so this is an example of contact dermatitis. And there are two types of contact dermatitis. One we see very frequently, that's irritant contact dermatitis. And one we see less frequency, frequently, less probably 20% of the time and that's allergic contact dermatitis. Um, and you may say, why do we care which one is which? Dr. Goldberg, can we just call it a, a contact dermatitis? And the reason for that is the management is different um, and the workup can be different. So irritant, much more common. This is not immune mediated and you really wanna take a good occupational history. It has to do with direct contact of a substance on the skin. Um, allergic is a type four delayed hypersensitivity. Um, these you kind of classically see in board questions um, with the belt buckle, for example, and the rash rate of the bug, belt buckle, um, and it tends to worsen with each repeated exposure. Patch testing is appropriate if you are thinking about allergic contact dermatitis. Um, so keep that in mind. And just to kind of highlight some of the differences, I know this is a busy slide, but one of the things that's pretty helpful is the evolution. So there is what's called a, a decrescendo effect, which is for irritant contact dermatitis, when the um, offending agent is removed, there's rapid improvement. With allergic contact dermatitis, there can actually be a worsening of the symptom even after that exposure has ceased. So just to keep that in mind. Um, and these are just some kind of classic examples. Um, in the upper left is uh, an example of contact dermatitis of the hand. And then these other ones I just thought were kind of cool looking. Um, obviously the, the one here on the upper right is um, an allergic contact dermatitis from poison ivy. Um, you can see the classic kind of ear dermatitis um, from jewelry. I thought the henna was really impressive and actually quite common, um, but an allergic reaction to, to henna and then the um, nickel reaction that you see here. So these lesions can be pruritic. They can become very thickened if it's continuous. So really important to take a good history. And obviously the most important thing is to remove the offending irritant. If the skin is inflamed, topical steroids are very appropriate. And we'll talk a little bit more about like, where do I even start with a topical steroid? How do I know what to prescribe? Um, but a good rule of thumb is that in areas of thinner skin, so intertriginous areas, axilla, under the breast, or the face, you wanna use a medium to low potency steroid, lower potency steroid. And in the other areas, if you have a really thick skin, for example, the palm of the hand, you can use higher potency steroids. What's really key is restoration of the epidermal barrier function. So in a patient who's washing their hands frequently and that friction is resulting in this kind of dermatitis, you really need to encourage very generous use of emollients. Um, and <clears throat> of course you wanna prevent further exposure. So if someone is um, coming in with a hand dermatitis from excessive washing, you wanna use plastic gloves with cotton liners to absorb the sweat. Um, the problem with latex is of course it can cause an allergic reaction. So you wanna to try to minimize that, really minimize hand washing when possible and um, use lukewarm water. So we're gonna go back to our question. And I'm just gonna pick any of the answers. I'm not saying this is the right one, but let's take a look. So the answer is 
thick emollients. This is a patient with classic hand dermatitis. When they introduce an occupation in a board question, there's probably a reason for it. They're telling you she washes her hands frequently. Um, and so really the key with this is to use thick emollients, use them frequently. Um, the reason epicutaneous patch testing is not appropriate is clinically and based on history, this sounds like a classic contact dermatitis from water. If the patient did not improve, that is something to think about, would be patch testing, but otherwise not your first choice answer. Um, oral fluconazole would be used to treat fungal infection. So if this patient had evidence of, you know, two feet, one hand syndrome with the tinea pedis in the foot um, and the hydroxy, the potassium hydrox uh, hydroxide microscopy was negative as well. Oral prednisone can improve flares, but then can actually um, result in relapses of chronic hand dermatitis. Um, so really important to focus on restoring the barrier function for these patients. Okay, so next, um, and these are not zebra cases, I will say that off the, the bat. This is a 28 year old with allergic rhinitis coming in with intermittent pruritus. And on this pic, in this picture, you can see this is the anticubital fossa. There is lichenified skin. Um, the patient reports extensive pruritus and dryness of the skin. And this is a case of eczema, which we see quite frequently outpatient. It's important to go back to medical school and think about what is eczema. And in a genetically predisposed individual, um, and that's important, most people have eczema as a child. Um, there is exposure of the, the epidermis, barrier, epidermal barriers disturbed. There is antigens in the environment that react with cells in the dermis of the skin and that causes inflammation. Patients then itch, they scratch, they further disturb that barrier. So the key is to really stop this cycle. And, and there are certain times of year, there are certain triggers for this. Um, some of you probably have eczema and you know what your triggers are. Um, dry skin, we've been seeing a lot of this recently in the winter, heat, sweating, infections, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> here's some visuals of what eczema may look like. It may present with sort of erythematous papules. Um, it may present with hyperpigmentation and exaggeration of skin markings that you see in the upper right border. Yes, in adults, it tends to be more localized. Flexural surfaces are sort of the classic that you learn. Um, and here you can see some um, sort of grayish um, skin on in the central picture on the dorsum of the hand. And then sort of like, again, the classic textbook image of erythema, um, in the anticubital fossa with some excoriation. Just to um, bring to your attention, so dyshydrotic eczema is something that we see quite often as well. This is generally vesicular and it's pruritic. So the patient in which you see vesicular lesions on the, on the hand, you wanna be thinking about dyshydrotic eczema. They often respond well um, to steroids. So what do we use to treat atopic dermatitis? Emollients should be part of daily eczema treatment. Um, prevention is key, right? So in primary care, we're going to focus on xerosis reducing behaviors. You want to use lukewarm water. You want to make sure that emollients are applied immediately when someone gets out of the bath or shower. Use them generously. Um, minimize washing when you can. And if that's not adequate, topical steroids are really the next next in line, which most of our patients have. Um, low potency should be used for the face and intertriginous areas again, and medium potency or, or higher potency for other body sites. Keep in mind, if moderate or severe dermatitis, you may want to think about topical calcineurin inhibitors. Um, these can be steroid sparing agents um, when you're really concerned about prolonged use of topical steroids, which have side effects. Okay, next case, 34 year old with concerns about a rash on her forehead. And, and looking at this image, you can see um, some flaking of the skin. You can see some hypopigmented areas on the, the hairline of this patient. And she says it's worse in winter and it's mildly pruritic. But think in your head, we're not gonna do a poll, but think in your head, what might this be? 
And this is again, another very common condition in outpatient medicine, a common dermatitis, which is seborrheic dermatitis. It is chronic and relapsing and occurs in areas rich in sebaceous glands. When we're talking about um, location and describing a rash, make sure to know where do different rashes tend to present. This is classically on the face, the middle of the face, in bearded areas, at the hairline, and on the scalp. Um, and it's important to note that depending on the patient, the presentation can differ. So um, Black patients much more likely to have hypopigmentation as a presentation of seborrheic dermatitis versus sort of the typical yellow greasy um, um, lesions on the face that we would see. Here are some pictures of classic seborrheic dermatitis. Um, you can see the flaking on the picture on the left, some, some mild erythema. Um, this is an example on the beard area of hypopigmentation, and then again on the, on the face and surrounding um, the eyebrows. So how do we treat? So Typically, patients can get an over-the-counter um, um, antifungal shampoo. If they don't respond to that, then we can give a prescription of like ketoconazole shampoo. Um, and that's used usually two times a week. They leave on for a few minutes and then rinse off. If there is scale or inflammation, you can combine this with a high-potency steroid foam. Um, but consider hair washing frequency. So um, certain populations may wash their hair less frequently. Frequently, there was a study looking at African American women, um, and the majority, when their physician gave them a prescription for an antifungal shampoo, was, "I only wash my hair once a week. I'm not going to use this twice a week." So you need to be cognizant and ask patients questions. Um, so people who wash their hair less frequently, you might want to consider a foam, which tends to stay on. You don't wash it off; it stays on. Um, and can be left in place. And so it may be more acceptable to the patient with any kind of treatment, right? Patient-centered care, you wanna make the best treatment is the one that the patient will use. For the face, you can use topical antifungals, low potency topical steroids. And of note, that will improve the hypopigmentation um, that is associated with <coughs> seborrheic dermatitis. For facial hair, you can use ketoconazole shampoo daily then once per week, plus or minus a low potency steroid and encourage um, and, and shaving. Okay, let's move on to our next question. <clears throat> okay, 68 year old woman is evaluated for a 12 month history of swelling of both of her lower legs. Over the past four months, there was worsening edema, erythema, scaling, and itching of the lower legs. She has not used any prescription over-the-counter topical medications or emollients. Medical history is significant for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and her medications include lisinopril, amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, and metformin. On physical exam, her vitals are normal, her BMI is 32, and the skin findings excuse me, are as shown. There is no tenderness. Pedal pulses are strong bilaterally and lab studies, including her leukocyte count are within the normal range. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And push yourself to commit. So this is stasis dermatitis. Um, and you can see here from the images, this is very common in patients with lower extremity edema, regardless of the etiology, the pooled blood can cause a cutaneous reaction. It can present as hyperpigmentation. Um, again, patients report itching, dry skin. There can be associated inflammation and erythema in acute stasis dermatitis. And the treatment for this is by far and large is to reduce the edema. So um, there's a wonderful Curbsiders episode. I think it's on, um, I don't know what the main topic is, but the physician expert talks about the calf muscle as 
the peripheral part, meaning get the blood flow moving. If a patient can exercise, encourage exercise, walking, uh, leg elevation, compression. This is ultimately the gold treatment for stasis dermatitis because that is the underlying cause. In terms of skincare, you need to encourage gentle skin cleansing and emollient use where loose clothing, you can use mid-potency steroids um, with wet dressings. If there's like a lot of exudative edema, you should use wet dressings. You want to be able to remove the crusts um, and things that surface. And obviously, if there's a secondary infection, you'll need to give an oral antibiotic. One thing to keep in mind is patients with, with stasis dermatitis are prone to getting allergic contact dermatitis because they frequently will use topical um, medications like triple antibiotic ointments, for example. So it can be a more complicated picture. Um, so really, again, the goal, try to reduce the edema and basics of skincare. You know, from your clinic sites, you can refer patients for home wound care if needed, um, which often I will do if a patient has difficulty um, really doing that themselves or they, have, or they don't have anyone in the home who can really help with that. Um, and so let's go back to our question. <clears throat> okay, so which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Obviously, this, the answer to this is stasis dermatitis, um, but let's understand why. So again, in this patient, you see the bilateral lower extremity edema, erythema, um, scaling, the patient, you know, has pruritus. Unlike cellulitis, um, this usually is bilateral. Cellulitis more likely to present as unilateral, very atypical to pre present with bilateral involvement. Um, I mentioned the allergic contact dermatitis. So one of the answers said allergic contact dermatitis. Well, they haven't used any other topical medications. There's a reason the writers of this question mentioned that. Um, and then leukocytoclastic vasculitis, you would expect more of the non-blanching lesions, right? The violaceous lesions. And psoriasis would tend to present more with plaque-like lesions, which we don't see here. Okay. So I want to take a moment to talk about treatment. Um, you know, obviously the treatment sounds very similar for each of these conditions, right? We're going to use emollients, we're going to use topical steroids, but it's important to know what to use and why we choose to use what we use. So for any topical steroids, what's important to know is the potency, the vehicle, and the amount. This is a chart showing there are seven classes of topical steroid, and I recommend writing down, I have it in my phone, one topical steroid for each class. They've sort of narrowed some of them down here. Um, and that can be very helpful when you're on the fly in the clinic, need to prescribe something. Um, class seven are the lowest potency steroids. These are the hydrocortisone 1% creams, right? These are the ones you're gonna use on the intertriginous and facial areas. And then class one are your highest potency steroids, which I have to tell you, I have very rarely prescribed. Um, in the primary care clinic. And the tables often look like this. I know up to date has a really nice table as well, an extensive table. Um, but that again, this is just to highlight there are many different options of topical steroids, including different formulations or vehicles within each of these classes. Most important thing, try to use the least potent steroid for the least amount of time. When you are bordering on two weeks of topical steroid use, you are prone to side effects. And these can be things like the classic atrophy we see, striae, right? Um, and so we really need to be careful with how much topical steroid we give a patient because it can easily be overused. And some of that resulting um, damage may not be reversible. The vehicle matters. Vehicles impact potency. So vehicles are comprised of different combinations of water um, um, and kind of lipophilic agents, so and oils, and they come in different combinations. And what's important about the vehicle is the location that you're treating. 
So someone who has very thick hyperkeratotic lesions on the palm of their hand, you may want to think about an ointment, which is very occlusive. Um, and it can be a bit goopy. So like Vaseline, fantastic, right? Love Vaseline in terms of its efficacy, but it may not be cosmetically agreeable um, for our patients. And so you need to think about, again, what is the patient most likely to use? Um, creams are generally right in the middle. Um, they're usually cosmetically appealing um, and they may not be as potent as an ointment. Um, for example, a key lesson is if you're using an emollient and a topical steroid, someone gets out of, they have atopic dermatitis, they get out of the shower, apply the emollient first, and then wait 15 minutes or so before you place the topical steroid on. Um, and then lotions you need to be careful with. So lotions are very cosmetically appealing. They spread very easily, but um, gels and some lotions can actually be drying. So you want to avoid, um, avoid that. And I didn't mention this earlier, but when you're talking with patients about their, um, their hair care or what they're using for their hair, some of the, the agents that people tend to use on a daily basis can actually cause more problems. So I'm thinking of things like pomades, oils. So again, prevention is key. You want to make sure patients with seborrheic dermatitis who are using pomades and oils every day, try to refrain from doing that and really apply the foam to the scalp. Um, <clears throat> in the same way, people may think that they're moisturizing their skin with lotions, but in actuality, depending on the content, it may actually be drying. And again, never use class one agents on skin folds, face, or genitals. So how much amount? My favorite thing in the clinic, no, my least favorite thing in the clinic is when I, I am going to e-prescribe a medication to the pharmacy, the resident's like, I'll put the order for the steroid in and never do residents complete the whole order. They put in the right you know, potency and, and then the rest of it is blank. And I, I attribute that somewhat to not knowing how do we prescribe steroids? How, what is the amount of steroid I need to prescribe? So the way that this is done in dermatology is by fingertip unit measurement or FTUs. And I like this chart because it's very straightforward. If you have a patient with hand dermatitis um, and some inflammation and you want to start a topical steroid, for a hand, that's one FTU. If you have both hands, that's going to be two FTUs or one gram. And if you're doing that twice a day, that's two grams. So let's say you want to give a two week course, two grams, you know, two grams a day for 15 or 14 days, whatever, it's about 30 grams. So be cognizant when you're prescribing these, because the worst thing we can do is patient doesn't have enough steroid to last. Maybe they have more of their body that requires um, topical steroid and we haven't given them enough. And if anyone's ever tried to call the Ryan centers, you know how difficult that can be to navigate and our patients just kind of throw their hands in the air. So we've really done a disservice to our patients. So take home points from this talk. Um, please review how inflammation looks different in different skin tones. I'm gonna leave you with a slide on some, some resources that could be quite useful to you. If a patient says, I'm itchy, uh, my, my skin feels dry, you're gonna be thinking about causes of dermatitis. I've listed, a, I, we've reviewed a few of them today. There are many more than that. Avoid high potency steroids in the intertriginous and facial areas and really encourage prevention and restoration of skin barriers. Please don't have a low threshold to refer to dermatology. Much of this we can field ourselves in primary care. It's simply a matter of seeing it over and over again. Um, here are some of the derm resources that I've included. I've used some of these for the presentation today. But, you know, derm is one of those things you really just have to keep going through images over and over and over again. So um, I'm sure these will be accessible to you guys. And if not, you can just reach out to me um, via email.